This morning, we, have, uh, we will welcome Dr. Shane Lopez, Senior Scientist for Gallup Education, as our keynote speaker. He is the author of Making Hope Happen, a book, by the way, that you'll be taking home today. And Dr. Lopez researches the links between hope, strengths development, academic success, and overall well-being, and collaborates with scholars around the world on these issues. He specializes in hope and strengths enhancement for students from preschool through college education. As part of his research, he's also uh, helped measure hope, engagement, and well-being that taps into the hearts and minds of U.S. public school students to determine what drives achievement. Gallup Education, you may be aware, I hope, has been long devoted to helping us better understand what's happening with our youth and how we as individuals in a society can advance that. We share a mission of enhancing educational opportunities for our youth. And in fact, many of you uh, may have taken the Strengths Quest Finder. Some of you may have participated when we partnered with Gallup in the first, and, or the first Castle Sotal Faculty Development Conference. And most recently, and Shane was involved in this as well, we've worked with Gallup to help us develop some measures of student success that we're using in our Creighton University Quality Index. So again, we share a common mission and vision, and I think you're going to hear some things today that are going to keep you hopeful about what it is we do. So Creighton is grateful for the ongoing relationship and partnership with Gallup. We now welcome, please join me in welcoming Dr. Shane Lopez for this morning's keynote address. I just got back from Denton, Texas, where they measured the hope, engagement, and well-being of 4,000 of their students and found out um, that they have a very hopeful and thriving uh, student body. Um, what's impressive is that over 895,000 uh, students participated in the Gallup student poll last year, grades K through 5, 895,000. In the last five years or so, we've had two and a half million students complete the Gallup student poll um, to determine the hope, engagement, and well-being of America's students. What I want you to know is that the first college survey, the first Gallup student poll college survey, we don't even have a name for it, it's so new, was completed right here at Creighton University. So I'll tell you just a little bit about the results from, from that survey in the context of, of this hope work. But you guys are trailblazers. Um, we have tons of requests for more of this work to be done at other universities, but you can go on record as saying that you were the first to get, complete the Gallup College Student Survey uh, and one of the first in the nation to complete the Gallup Alumni Survey. So thank you so much for that partnership. You've also been longstanding partners um, with us around StrengthsFinder, so I'd like you to raise your hand if you've taken StrengthsFinder at least once. Great. Raise your hand if you've taken it more than once. Why have you taken it more than once? <laughs> Just take it once. Um, no, apparently our people in marketing love it when you take it more than once. But um, you, once you get your top five, Don Clifton, who developed the StrengthsFinder, said you can work your entire life on developing your top talent. You can work your entire life on developing your top talent. So no need to take it more than once unless you have more than one life to live. Um, so um, what I want you to do, and this is not a, a talk about strengths today, I'm going to focus on hope, but what I want you to do um, is promise me a couple of things. Number one, by the end of the day, you will know your top five strengths in order of intensity. Your top five strengths in order of intensity. We've given the Strengths Finder survey almost 12 million times. Fewer than six million people, I promise you, can tell us their top five strengths in order of intensity. So I want you to be different. So raise your hand if you know your top five strengths in order of intensity right now. See what I'm saying? It, it really, it needs to stick, and that information is so important. So at some point this afternoon, pull up your top five from your last administration of the, the Strengths Finder survey and learn those top five strengths in order of intensity. So mine are futuristic maximizer, arranger, ideation, and strategic. I took this survey in 1999. I haven't taken it again because I spent a whole lot of time just focused on futuristic, maximizer, arranger, ideation, and strategic. So those are my top five. What does that say about me? Futuristic, maximizer, arranger, ideation, strategic. 
Um, for example, this morning, futuristic maximizer, in my mind I have given this presentation and it went famously. <laughs> so that's what a futuristic maximizer does. They live in the future and they try to make the future better um, and they rehearse the future time and time again. Um, so that's what I know about me and my top five. By the end of the day, I would also like you to know not just your top five in order of intensity, but also I'd like you to tell one story to someone you love about what you do best. One story to someone you love about what you do best. So I could spend all day talking about strengths. I'm here to talk about hope. But those are the two things I'd like you to do. So can you do those two things for me? Number one, get your top five and memorize them in order of intensity. And number two, tell one story about your strengths to someone you love. Tell one story about what you do best to someone you love. Now, we do a lot of training around strengths, and we're happy to come do more training with you. But I've got to tell you, the secret to doing um, a lot with your strengths is just to do more of what you do best every day. That's it. So I just summarized the five-week course. OK? So you're certified in that little nugget right there. Um, just do more of what you do best every day. Do more of what you do best every day. And then you'll get to, get to really live throughout your strengths. Any questions about Strengths Finder or Strengths Quest while we're talking about that? And I do want this to be interactive. We'll have time for questions at the end, but I do want you to just throw your questions out at any point. Yes? Yeah, go to. You can resurrect them. That's exactly right. Go to gallopstrengthcenter.com, and it'll answer your questions about where to go to find your original strengths. And if not, it'll have a contact button, and then just con gallopstrengthcenter.com, um, and then you can contact the folks at Gallup, and they'll walk you through that process. Um, but yeah, don't take if you can't find them, don't take it again. I, I really. You know, if you want a certain strength and you keep taking the strengths finder, um, I, I, I worked with a, a group at Nationwide, and their boss, the boss at Nationwide, had analytical. So their team, everybody kept taking the strengths finder so they could get analytical, so they could be like the boss. And I was like, he's got enough analytical for all of you guys. You don't need to be like him. You need to surround him with different, different talent um, that would make his analytical shine in different ways. All right, that's a great question. Any other questions about StrengthsFinder? StrengthsFinder is the same thing as StrengthsQuest. Your students take it under that name, typically StrengthsQuest. Um, StrengthsFinder is the tool, the survey. StrengthsQuest is the educational package or program that surrounds that tool or survey. Other questions or comments? All right, so you, you're doing two things for me by the end of the day. You're going to learn your top five in order of intensity. And that's why we give them to you in that order. It's not a random order. They actually, they're, the strongest one is at the top, and, and the fifth, mo, uh, fifth one is your fifth strongest. Um, and then you're going to share what you do best, a success around your strength, with someone you love by the end of the day. Okay? And I'll, I'll know my top five, but then I'll, I'll tell my wife about something I did that was super futuristic. Okay? Um, <laughs> And yes, did we make up some of the words on this uh, survey? Sure. Woo is kind of a word, but it means winning others over on this survey. Um, individualization, I'm not sure if it was ever a word before we put a word to it. So we, we kind of play with the language a little bit, but it certainly is a good survey. All right, I'm going to talk about making hope happen. If you want to learn more about my work, uh, you can read the book you get today. Um, you can also go to hopemonger.com uh, and look at some of the work we do around the country uh, on hope. But first, I want to tell you about this guy here. Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you guess. Um, anyone knows who this is? There's no reason you should. So there are only wrong answers until you get the right one. Go ahead. <laughs> it's a statue of Hadrian. You remember Hadrian? Hadrian's wall. Hadrian's wall, he built while he was an emperor, uh, famous emperor. Um, I guess all emperors are somewhat famous. But anyway, um, he was an emperor, and he was born in uh, the south of Spain uh, many, many, many moons ago. But this statue means a lot to me because 
it was in our town square for the longest time in a little town called New Iberia, Louisiana. So I was born and raised in New Iberia, Louisiana. Um, you're going to say I don't have an accent. Um, I do have an accent under certain conditions. Um, I won't tell you what those are. Uh, but I also, I also um, went to a Catholic boys' school, um, and our brothers did not like our accents. So they were from Ohio. So we quickly adopted an Ohio accent, um, whatever that is. Um, so, but this statue was in the town square in New Iberia, Louisiana. Well, it actually was next to a bank near the town square. And um, the statue was purchased by the banker during a trip he took to New Orleans. Um, and he picked up the statue in New Orleans at an auction and then brought it back to New Iberia, put it in the bank, right in the bank near the teller's window until the bank got too busy, too big, and then they moved it outside. And the problem with that, it was just feet from this, this, the main street in town. So just it was really in a precarious spot. Um, just a little bit about New Iberia. There are two major banks. One had a statue in it, and the other had a grizzly bear in it. So growing up, I thought for sure every bank would have a statue or a grizzly bear in it. So when I, when I ventured out to Lafayette, Louisiana, the big town next door, um, and I went to the bank, I was disappointed that I didn't find some large creature staring down at me. Um, but this statue stood right on, next to the bank, and the street was right here, okay? So there was much concern that one day the statue would be run over. But really what happened that was more problematic is that every Saturday, well, Friday night, Saturday night, um, the college students would come back from Lafayette, and they'd adorn the statue with kind of parts of their evenings like uh, Hawaiian leis and togas, which I thought was totally redundant, but togas. Um, uh, beer cans, Jack Daniels bottles, candles, you name it. And ultimately, one of his fingers broke off. So one of Hadrian's fingers broke off. So one of the local historians said, you know what? We've been having the statue here for about 50 years. We really ought to invest in it and protect it and insure it at the proper level. So he talked to the bank. And they said, okay, let's get an insurance guy to come check it out. Got an insurance guy to come check it out, and he said, well, you know, I think it's pretty old, and I don't deal with antiquities, so let's get somebody from New Orleans to come check it out. So someone came from New Orleans and did a little bit of research and discovered the provenance around the statue. And the statue that had been sitting outside the bank building right off the main drag is 2,000 years old. 2,000 years old. So the bank, being a bank, decided to sell the statue. <laughs> Bring it inside, oh no. For a little while, I kid you not, they put kind of a glass partition around it. And I'm thinking, a big farm truck will have no problem with that glass partition. But um, no, they decided to um, put a glass partition around it. But um, during the oil bust, um, they decided they had to sell the statue. Um, and they took the statue to New York City, sold it at Sotheby's auction for $1 million. For $1 million. Now, this was the most beautiful thing. In fact, for the longest time, I think it was the only statue of any significance in our little town of 35,000 people. It was the only statue. But by far, I mean, look at it. It's just a beautiful, beautiful piece of art, beautiful work. And it was the oldest most beautiful thing we had in our community. And we treated it poorly. We didn't treat it well. We didn't keep it safe. We didn't protect it. We adorned it with revel signs of revelry. Um, we just didn't care for it the way we should. And that's how I think about hope. It's one of the most ancient, most beautiful, most powerful things in our society. And we just don't honor it. We don't care for it. We don't treat it well. We don't respect it. And what I want to do today is get you to tap back into your personal hope, to your personal hope, because at some point, if not today, you had this overwhelming sense of hope that you could change society by becoming an educator, by becoming a leader, by becoming someone who works with students and changes their lives. So I want you to get to tap back into that hope but also, 
I want you to learn how to spread hope to others. And you're already doing that. But I want you to learn how to do it even better. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and at any point you have questions, let me know. But that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to t tell stories. We're going to talk about a little bit of research. Um, and then we're going to tell more stories. All right? You with me? Okay. Any questions about Hadrian before? He, I, I can't find him. Um, the the um, person who purchased it um, wanted to remain anonymous. So um, he once stood outside of, uh, if you've ever seen Downton Abbey, he was on that kind of estate for the longest time before he came to uh, New Orleans and was sold. Um, but right now he's somewhere on the East Coast and no one really knows where he is. So I think that's a big retirement goal of mine, <laughs> Ser searching for Hadrian. So I'm going to get an old convertible and drive around the Northeast and look for Hadrian. Um, here's what I've learned. So I'm going to summarize 20 years of research in one slide. It's always nice when you can do that, you know, just summarize all your work in, in one uh, bold statement. But what I found is that hope is about psychologically investing in the future in a way that it pays off today. Hope is about psychologically investing in the future in a way that it pays off today. So what is hope? It's the belief that the future will be better than the present, combined with some belief that you have some power to make it so. Hope is the belief that the future will be better than the present, combined with a belief that you have some power to make it so. It's not optimism. It's more than optimism. Optimism is just that first part. That second part is not there in, in, in optimism. So optimism is the belief that the future will be better than the present. Now, where that power comes from is really up to you. So here, here's a way to determine where your power comes from, that, that belief in the power to, that you can make it so. Um, raise both of your hands like this. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to ask you on three, point to where your power of hope comes from. And you can point to your head, your heart, or the holy, wherever your holy is. Okay? Your head, your heart, or the holy. You have two hands, so you can point to both head and heart, head and holy, heart and holy, however you want to do it. Okay? All right, so on three, where does your power to hope come from? One, you got to follow directions, people. <laughs> come on. Two, three. All right, look around the room. You've got head and heart, heart and holy, head and holy. You've got lots of different definitions of where that power comes from. You've got just the holy. Wonderful. And that is just fine. That is just fine. You couple that belief that the future will be better than the present, and you combine it with that belief that you have some power to make that future better than the present. Those two things, wherever that power comes from, that's what hope is. That's what hope is. And we've been measuring and studying that brand of hope now for 20 years. And what we find again and again is that investing in the future pays off today. So let me tell you a quick story about a coworker of mine named AJ. Now, if you know anything about Gallup, we like to measure stuff all day, every day. Okay? So if you apply for a job at Gallup, you have to start on the website and you have to take a not strengths finder, you have to take a different kind of aptitude, strengths, talent measure. Um, and then you have to go through a series of interviews. And it's a pretty arduous process to get hired on at Gallup. Um, what AJ did was he circumvented that whole process um, just by happenstance. So AJ was sitting in a building one day, and this guy walked in, and they locked eyes. And AJ said, guy looks interesting. So he, AJ introduced himself to Jim, Jim Clifton, who's the CEO of Gallup. He goes, hi, hi, I'm, I'm AJ. What's your name? Jim says, I'm Jim, Jim Clifton. And AJ said, well, what do you do? And Jim said, well, you may not know the company, but I, I run this company called Gallup. Um, and AJ said, no, I don't, I don't know the company. Um, tell me a little bit about what you do. And he said, well, we do polling and we do consulting. And, and AJ was very intrigued. And AJ said, well, how can I get a job there? And Jim was kind of turned on by the pluckiness of this, this guy asking for a job. So Jim said, well, come visit me, and we'll talk more about it. And sure enough, they set up a time to, to meet, and AJ shows up at Jim's office at the appointed time, but now he knows everything about Gallup. 
He knows the history of Gallup. So you might know that George Gallup founded Gallup. He was one of the first pollsters ever. AJ knew that. The Cliftons bought Gallup in 1988 from the Gallups. Uh, AJ knew that. Turned it into a consulting company and now does all kinds of work around the world. AJ knew all of that. He knew where the company was going. He knew a lot of background on Jim. Um, and Jim was super impressed, so Jim kind of bypassed all the normal path to getting a job, and he said, AJ, you've got the job. Now go finish middle school, high school, and college, <laughs> and you can start when you're done. But AJ wasn't satisfied. He said, well, what about an internship? So at 11 years old, AJ became the first intern, preteen intern, at Gallup. And I've worked with him on a couple of different projects, and he's lights out. I mean, he really is an outstanding junior analyst, is his title. Um, and he comes back um, during his time off from school, and he participates in the work that we do in lots of meaningful ways. He's a, he's a built-in focus group around some of our uh, kid work, so he's very helpful in that way. But what AJ did is he invested in the future. He threw a line out there. And he decided to hope big. And because of that, he behaved differently today. Now, there's another example. And I'm going to give you examples from K through 12 and college and the workplace, OK? Um, there's another example of how this, this phenomenon works. Um, some researchers went to the uh, uh, Detroit public school system. And they met with students in, grades, uh, in grade 7. And this was a grade 7 uh, science class, big group of of students in grade seven science. And they divided the students into two groups. So you guys are in group A and you guys are in group B. And basically what they wanted to see is if they could get students to behave differently today by looking at some data from tomorrow, okay? So what they did was they gave the students, um, they gave students kind of a, a recruitment speech. And they said, okay, we're, they were acting like they were recruiters from the University of Michigan. So we're from the University of Michigan, rah, 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 go to the University of Michigan, go blue. Um, when you come to the University of Michigan, you're going to do great. Great things will happen. You'll get a four-year degree. And then for every year of college, and they showed a beautiful graph, for every year of college, this is the amount of money you'll make over and above what you'd make with a high school diploma. That was the whole intervention. Okay, so group A, that's what you got. Group B, they came to you and said, Rah, rah, go blue, University of Michigan, come to the University of Michigan. But oh, some of you may not go to the University of Michigan. But that's OK, because now I'm going to show you a picture of the income of people who didn't go to college but are, who, who are famous celebrities. So their data was about these famous celebrities that didn't go to college that made millions of dollars. Now, that, that's the independent variable, group A, group B, sl real slight intervention. What was the dependent variable? Whether you turned in the extra credit science assignment for tomorrow. That was it, OK? So real light touch intervention. You guys were eight times more likely to hand in the assignment the next day. Eight times more likely. When we connect a student's present to their future, wrap it around with some education and even thoughts of education, we get them to behave differently today. Now, those students that were here this morning giving those beautiful prayers, they behaved differently yesterday because of how you treated them tomorrow. So their yesterday was better because they were coming here today. Their today will be better because of the glow that they get from this experience. So hope is not sleight of hand, but it, it doesn't take a lot to build hope in people. So that's what I want to talk about. This is, if you fall asleep, just remember this slide, okay? <laughs> Investing in the future pays off today. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what we invest in. So we're going to have a little bit of table talk. Very simple question, and this relates to you right now. This question relates to you. We go around the country, around the world, through the Gallup World Poll and the Gallup Nightly Poll, um, and we ask people this question every now and again, um, and then I'll, I'll tell you the answers from around the world. But first, I want you to talk about for just 
three to five minutes, what are your hopes and dreams for the future? On a personal level, what are your hopes and dreams for the future? So some of you have three at the table, some of you are lonely and only have two at the table. Some of you have a big table. So divide it up however you want so that in three to five minutes we can have a quick report out. Uh, but what are your hopes and dreams for the future? Any questions about that? All right, go. I could let you take the rest of my three hours just talking about this. But I have to bring you back so we can move on. But how, how, often, how often, Cynthia, do you get to talk about your hopes and dreams with your colleagues? Not very often. Not very often. So think about that. Hope, and, and hope is what drives a lot of our behavior, yet we spend so little precious time talking about it. So you just had about five, six minutes to do that. Um, and I do want to learn what, what popped up in your, at your different tables. But just a rejoinder to this, this story, um, Chris was telling me that his family, his, on the mother's side, had a bicycle shop, which I went to as a kid, in New Iberia, Louisiana. That's a half mile from this statue. <laughs> I mean, literally. And then Katie's folks are from Lafayette as well, Katie Barton's folks. So we've got a lot of Lafayette and New Iberia, Louisiana connections in here. And she was telling me that there was a statue in Lafayette that her uncles would, would do bad things to. <laughs> so apparently it's a Louisiana custom, especially, especially around Mardi Gras. So big things happen to statues around Mardi Gras. Um, all right, so what are your hopes and dreams? So I'm just going to go around the room um, and pick on a few people and just tell me what, what are some of the things that came up at your table. Um, and I usually pick on people not looking at me. So, <laughs> so like you, you were, your head was turned. So what, what came up at your table? Um, and I'll repeat. With, oh, we've got mics. I think we talked about... Um, one, our kids and, and our children hoping that they'll be happy, um, whatever happiness means to them, and that our hope would be that we're also accepting of that happiness and that it might not be what we think of in our definition of. Yeah. Um, we talked about being healthy in order to enjoy their happiness. Um, so healthy, happy kids, successful kids. In their whatever success means whatever to them. Whatever success means yes. to them. So we did... We did a different survey of moms. Actually, we did a survey of moms of preschoolers, and we asked them, what do you want for your children? And number one was happiness, and number two was success. Um, so this was part of a project we did with goldfish snack crackers. Um, you, who buys most of the snack crackers in America? Moms. 85% of snack crackers are purchased by moms. So goldfish only cares about moms. I'll let you know. I, I served on this project um, for a while, and they would be like, every time they'd be, Shane, are you OK? We really don't care what you think, but we value your opinion greatly. Uh, um, so happiness and success, that's kind of rolled in uh, for our kids. Um, what about at this table? Everybody's looking at me, so we might have to pass on that table. Uh, no, go ahead. Yeah. Great. Um, <laughs> We discussed as we age, we want uh, to be healthy. Yeah. We want stability. We want independence. Um, we discussed our kids. We hope that they're healthy and happy. Uh, Lou wants to play bogey golf. Um, <laughs> what, what else did I miss here? I'm sorry. A meaningful life as we retire, that we give back still. Um, Joe brought up Act 3 so that we're still... We're st and we want to make a difference in other people's lives. All right, make a difference, be healthy, happy, play bogey golf. Those are some of the things that came up. What about in this back table here, Katie? Since our recorder slid the screen over to me, I'm the reporter apparently. Um, we talked to many similar things about retirement, travel, leaning leading meaningful lives, making an impact on the world, raising self-sufficient self children that won't come back to live at home <laughs> after they're grown. 
um, achieving financial stability in our retirements, uh, being able to spend them with, with our loved ones and just have leading meaningful lives in our careers and as we go forward in, in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anything different? Anything anybody want to add to, to this list? The point about values, uh -huh. about having an appreciation for all the great blessings and the contentment and the, the just appreciating what we have here in this country. So values, contentment, and gratitude. Concern for, for the values for the country as that will help us to have our hopes and dreams for our children in our you know, later years and things like that. Absolutely. And the impact was another one that was echoed before. Really having an impact and making a difference. Making a difference. And yeah. we know Wayne wants to see the Zach Brown band. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I didn't say bucket list. <laughs> I said hopes and dreams. I guess bucket list could be on there. Um, now I'm thinking about my bucket list. Give me, <laughs> give me five minutes. I'll be back. Um, so we asked this to people around the world, OK? And this is what summarizes what they said. They want a good job, make a difference, OK? And they want a great life, a good job and a great life. Jim Clifton wrote a book about um, kind of the, the fight for um, the jobs. Uh, called, it's called The Coming Jobs War. Um, and it's all about how every person in the world wants a good job, a meaningful way to spend their time. Um, Another way to think about a good job beyond a meaningful way to spend your time is, is more pragmatically, you want to work somewhat part-time to full-time. You know, usually people are, are craving full-time work. And you want to be engaged, which means you don't want a crappy job. No one says, oh, I'd like a really crappy job. I'd like to do that for 40 years, and then I'd like to retire and die. Yeah. <laughs> Most of us want a good job. and. We want to make meaning through that job. Now, what do we mean by a great life? A great life has to do with many of the things that you guys talked about in terms of health, happiness, um, contentment. In fact, we've broken it down, the, the great life, into five different categories. So number one is purpose. The first category of a great life is purpose. So having a sense of purpose. Number two is having a social community, a real strong social sense of social well-being, so social coherence, uh, coherence and connection. Number three is financial stability, financial stability. So you have purpose, you have social coherence, and then you have financial stability. Number four is physical well-being, physical well-being. So you, you do have your health intact and you're able to do the things you want to do. You're able to do things that other people your age are able to do. And then five, which some of you mentioned, is community well-being. So giving back, a sense of giving back. OK? These are the things that you all are thinking about when you talk about your hopes and dreams, that people around the world are thinking about when they talk about their hopes and dreams, and that your students are thinking about. The international students, some, some of these students were international students, if, if not all. They didn't come here and say, I want to come here so I can have uh, an OK life. They want a better life. They want a better life. So to what extent are we, A, measuring whether students are getting a good job or a great life, and B, promoting? that goal, encouraging that goal, encouraging the pursuit of that goal. Through the work that you're doing with Gallup and the alumni survey, we're actually measuring the extent to which people have good jobs and great lives after they graduate from Creighton. So you're getting to that. You're going to hear more about that in the fall, but you're getting to that. But these are the goals that pull you forward. The future pulls you forward. And these are the goals that pull you forward. So the further you get away from these goals in your daily life, the less gusto you have for the work you do every day. So these are the ones that need to be top of mind. Questions about what the world wants, questions about what the goals are, questions about the hopes and dreams of you or your students.
In professor training, I learned to wait 26 seconds for questions. All right, let's talk about this quote here. Um, who's read the book Thinking Fast and Slow? Okay, do you own the book or did you really read it? Oh, he owns it and he read it. So this Thinking Fast and Slow is a popular book. Uh, it's on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, it's written by Danny Kahneman, who's a psychologist who won a Nobel Prize for economics. Um, and um, it's also the book that um, through Amazon you can determine how many people um, have read a book uh, on Kindle and how many people have just bought the book on Kindle. And it has the um, honor of being the book most often purchased, but least often read. Um, <laughs> so it's a highly influential book to the people who actually read it. Um, but Danny said to me when we were talking about this hope work, and he was a senior scientist at Gallup for a long time, um, actually helped come up with a lot of the Gallup World poll questions. Um, and he told me, he said, we are strangers to our future selves. We are strangers to our future selves. Um, and we were at a bar at the time. So I took a drink of beer, and I was like, oh, Danny, that's so true. That's so true. I took a sip of beer, and I said, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> tell me more. Um, and he, he went on to tell me that we're the only creatures on the planet that think about the future in a complex way. We're the only creatures on the planet that think about the future in a complex way. And we behave as if we know what that future self wants and needs. But we have no way of knowing what that future self wants and needs more times than not. Okay? And the only way that I've figured out to close the gap between who you are today at point A and who you are at, at point B is to really focus on those hopes and dreams, focus on those hopes and dreams, and not get too distracted by all the other clutter of our psychological lives. So to be less of a stranger to our future selves, get closer to those hopes and dreams that we talked about earlier. So the good job and the great life. Now, if you're supervising someone, I'm, I'm weaving in some strengths here. Who, who supervises people? Raise your hand if you have some supervisees of any sort. Okay, um, good to know. Um, if you supervise someone, what, a, what percentage of the time do you spend talking to someone about past behavior versus future behavior? That's an important thing to think about because we are strangers to our future selves, but when we meet someone in a, in a supervisory, supervisory context, um, we have a lot of decisions to make. One decision that we think is automatic at Gallup is that you spend 75% of your time focused on what's right and 25% of your time focused on what's wrong with the supervisee. 75% of the time focused on what's right and 25% focused on what's wrong. And you may be thinking, in what situations does this apply? It could be teacher-student. Um, we preach the same thing to elementary teachers giving feedback to parents at parent-teacher parent conferences. It could be manager, employee at Best Buy, or it could be you guys here on campus. The other thing I want you to think about is to what extent you're giving feedback on the past, which cannot be changed, versus focusing on the future, which is wide open. So those are two things about feedback that, that we need to be a little, bit, a little bit more deliberate about. Number one, focusing on what's right in the individual, and number two, focusing on what future behavior can be rather than on what past behavior was. Um, we just get into a rut when we, when we give feedback to other people. All right, I want to tell you another story about someone who, who embodies hope because I really want you to get that sense of hope that surrounds us um, every day. Um, her name is Tara Rye Trent. Raise your hand if you've heard the story of Tara Rye Trent. Oh, you've heard the story of Tara Rye Trent? You want to tell the story? Okay. Um, <laughs> it's a great story, as you know. Um, Tara Rye was born in a small village in Zimbabwe. And um, at a very young age, she wanted to go to school. But guess what? Girls weren't allowed to go to school. So she would secretly do her brother's homework. 
So he would come home every day from school, and Tara or I would sit on a rock that she kind of fashioned into a school desk, and she'd do her brother's homework. Well, brother took homework back to school, and it was better than his classroom work. So the teacher very soon realized that something's happening at home involving a sibling or a friend and investigated the situation. Comes home and finds that Terari is doing this, the brother's homework and invites Terari to school. And for the first ter time, Terari said, I could sit in a desk and raise my hand um, and learn something like other, other boys, primarily. So she went to school for a couple of terms, but then she was married off, I think at the age of 12 or 13 years old. Um, and her husband didn't want her to go to school anymore. So Tara had this passion for learning, and she also had this deep desire to make her family's life better, to have a great life. So one day, Heifer International shows up in her village, and Tara told me this is the question she asked the woman, Joe Luck, from Heifer International. She said, Terari, what are your hopes and dreams? That was the question. And Terari, what did Terari come up with? Well, she's very pragmatic. She said, I want to earn a high school diploma, get a BS, an MA, and a PhD. She had only days worth of school. Days worth of school. So Heifer International decided they were going to support Terari in her pursuit of some education. Terai took full advantage of the support she got. She got the high school equivalency. Um, she then got money from um, Heifer and money from her village through the sales of goats and chickens and cows um, to come to the U.S. And she said she wanted to go to a place that was a lot like Zimbabwe to ease the adjustment of her and her five kids. So they sent her to Oklahoma. made a lot of sense to no one. Um, she went to Oklahoma State University, and it was there that she was pursuing her bachelor's degree, but the money that her, her community had raised, the money Heifer had, had given her, ran out. And they were really living hand to mouth. They were living in a bad trailer. Um, they didn't have a lot of food to eat every night, um, if any. Um, and then someone from Oklahoma State University, a guy named Ron Beer. I don't know if you've ever heard of Ron. You, you know this guy, right? Say again. Vice President of Student Affairs, absolutely right. And just kind of a legend, apparently. Uh, every time you know, someone knows him, they think great things about him. He interceded in Terrorize life, got her connected to Habitat for Humanity, got her connected to um, food resources, got her connected to financial aid, got her connected to all sorts of things, ultimately helped her deport her husband, who was beating her throughout this whole process. Um, and she completed her degree at Oklahoma State University. She then, and Ron's help was amazing, she calls Ron her hero, so I, I interviewed Ron uh, for this book, and I interviewed Terai for this book, and they said the same thing. Without, without any knowledge of what the other had said, Terai said, Ron's my hero. And I said, Ron, how would you describe Terai? He said, Terai's my hero. So these two people were connected through hope. And then she went on to get her master's degree and her PhD. And she went on to become... This, how, do, how do you know Terrorize's story? Yeah, yeah, she came to town. We, we brought her to town at Gallup, and then she came to town for the ICANN conference. Um, and she became, during this whole process, she became Oprah's favorite guest ever. Oprah's favorite guest ever, which came with uh, a gift from Oprah's Angel Foundation of $1.2 million dollars to build schools in Zimbabwe. So that's what hope can do, but, but I want you to remember the part that Ron played. I want you to remember the part that Jim Clifton played in AJ's life, okay? 
These people appear with big hopes, but in every situation, they need someone else's hope. They need to borrow hope from someone else. People, as you walk out here today, people are going to want to borrow hope from you. So how can you make sure that you're lending that hope to them? Uh, and that's what we'll get to in hour three of my talk. <laughs> I know someone will cut me off at some point, so I'm doing okay. Um, let's talk about how much hope matters. So we've done study after study looking at hope and academic success. Um, we've done 50 studies, to be exact. And we tried to determine uh, through a meta-analysis to what extent does hope make a difference in academic success. Um, and what we found is that there's a 12% bump in school outcomes uh, thanks to hope. So hope makes the difference of about a letter grade to students. So two equally intelligent students, one's high hope, one's low hope, the student with high hope will make a letter grade better than the student with low hope, essentially. So from our studies, we know hope matters significantly when it comes to school. And this is grades K through 12 and higher ed. Um, one study we just recently did that we're trying to publish right now looks at hope and um, uh, a group of students over a six year span. So it was freshman hope. So we, we measured the hope of students at their freshman year and then followed these students for six years to determine what made a difference in terms of graduation, um, on time graduation, and all that good stuff. Um, SAT, ACT um, fell out of our measurement model after year one, and HOPE made a difference in on-time graduation at year four, and it made a difference in GPA throughout the study. So ACT and SAT make a difference just for a short period of time, and we know that in terms of student outcomes, um, but HOPE makes a difference in terms of making sure students graduate on time and get the GPA that they need to do whatever they want to do next. A friend of mine did another study like this one, but looking at law, stu law students. And of course, the LSAT is, is the currency in law school to get into law school. He wanted to know what predicted um, law school ranking better, HOPE or LSAT scores. And I told him, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree. It's got to be LSAT scores because the whole industry is based on LSAT scores. It was hope. It was hope. Hope predicted law school ranking better than LSAT scores. Okay? So this is something that we can measure as something that makes a really big difference. Now, why does it make a really big difference? Well, let me stop here. Any questions about the basic studies, the meta-analyses, or the longitudinal studies? I don't want to get too mired down in those, but any questions about those? Why do students um, who are hopeful do better in school? Well, because they're excited about the future. That's one thing that, that they all share in common. Now, I want to ask you what, what, a couple of questions that might seem off the mark, um, but I've told you a story about a Hadrian statue from my hometown, so now I feel like I can tell you anything. Um, um, raise your hand if you've ever rented a car. All right, everybody, everybody that's rented a car. I hate renting cars, by the way. I just hate it. I, I, I don't want to go on and on about it, but, but I just hate it. I was in Denton, Texas, and the option was to rent a car or to take a taxi. Unfortunately, I took a taxi um, a pretty long ways, and the guy had apparently smoked a whole carton of cigarettes before I got into the taxi. So it, it was stifling. Um, but enough about me. Well, we'll come back to me. Um, <laughs> all right, so everybody's rented a car. Now raise your hand if you've ever washed a rental car washed. Three people. Under what conditions do you wash a rental car? <laughs> do you have a story that goes on? He has a story. All right. You want to tell the full story or just give me the, the cliff note version? I got stuck in the mud. The car was like mud. I couldn't take it back. Like she got stuck in the mud and to spun. get out, spun out. Spun, spun, spun. And this is like in your neighbor's yard or something like that? <laughs> Stuck in the mud in her neighbor's yard. In a very rural place. Yeah. Yeah. Got out of the mud, but the car was a mess. So you got out all by yourself. All by yourself. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. But then eventually you got out. And the first thing on your mind is I've got to wash this car. <laughs> you might have high responsibility on the strengths finder. I don't know. I don't know. I can appreciate that because I worked at budget. So people would bring us those cars. Oh. So you wash rental cars at work. Yeah. Part of your job. All right. Would you ever do it now that you're not at budget? Would you ever wash a rental car? No, but I have an appreciation for returning it in a good condition. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, the one story that I, I got a couple of years back, um, I was presenting um, here in town, as a matter of fact, and I asked the big crowd um, if they've ever washed a rental car, and only one guy had. And I was like, okay, I've got to hear this story, because there's always a good story behind it. Um, and he had been to one of those wildlife safaris like, like we have out there. Um, and he had passed a bunch of monkeys. And the monkeys were throwing stuff. <laughs> stuff. Let's just leave it at stuff. And the monkeys threw a whole bunch of stuff at the car. So he felt like he couldn't return it uh, full of you know what. Uh, so monkey stuff. So he washed the car. Why don't we wash rental cars? We're responsible people. Why don't we wash rental cars? You've already paid for it. Someone else, so, someone else is doing it as part of the fee. Why else? Not ours. We don't own it. We don't own it. Now think about this and, and really flex your abstraction a little bit. How often do we ask students to wash rental cars? How often do we ask students to work on goals that they don't really own? To work on hopes and dreams that we really haven't connected them to yet? To work on things that they don't believe in? Quite a bit. Quite a bit. So the more we can get students to work on goals that they own, to work on things that they believe in, to work on projects, the more excited we can make them about the future. So there's that word salience. The salience of a goal makes a big difference when it comes to hope. So if a goal is highly salient, highly important, um, owned by the student, then they're much more likely to work on it than if the goal is not salient to them. So somehow we need to make sure that students are working on salient goals. What we found through the Gallup Alumni Survey is that the extent to which students are working on projects for longer than a semester makes a big difference in their future workplace engagement and well-being. If they're working on projects, so we all know the value of project-based learning. But if students are saying that I worked on a project for longer than a semester during my college career, the likelihood of them being engaged and thriving in their future lives goes up, okay? So hope is a big deal when it comes to um, academic performance, because hopeful students are excited about the future, hopeful students go to school. You remember that whole Michigan rah-rah thing? Well, it's the same thing. If you get students excited about tomorrow, they'll show up for class tomorrow. If you show up for class today, if you get students excited about something in their lives, they're more likely to go to school. Now, we don't take attendance as much maybe as we could or should in college life, but in high school life we do. And there are some communities in America where today, Friday, 50% of high school students are absent. 50% of high school students are absent. And what these communities are trying to do is incentivize education when, in fact, they should be trying to spread hope to students so that they're more likely to go to school. Because incentives, many studies have demonstrated, don't work in trying to promote um, student um, participation and student uh, enrollment, and student, um, students going to school. Hopeful students are engaged. Um, I've got to tell you something. I, I, did, I, gave, I gave you praise for being one of the first schools in the country to do the college student survey, and one of the first schools in the country to do the uh, Gallup alumni survey. Um, I would love it if you were one of the first schools in the country to do a faculty and staff engagement survey. Now, I would love it if I could say it would be free, but it wouldn't be. Um, 
and I'm not in sales, I'm on the science side. But we go around the country and we talk about faculty and staff engagement, but we can't get schools to turn on this survey because I don't know why, but faculty and staff have a hard time completing surveys about themselves that then go public, all right? And maybe it's because of the, the fear of the results. Um, we did a random representative sample of American teachers, grades K through 12. How many American teachers are engaged at work. Now, that's involved in and enthusiastic about the work they do. What percentage of American teachers are engaged at work? Throw out a number. It's 31%. 31% of American teachers are engaged at work. What percentage of American employees are engaged at work? 30. 30. 30. It has been 35 some years, but it's 30 now. 30. 30%. So teachers are right there with American employees. All right, now here, here's the crazy question. What percentage of you in this room are engaged at work? I just told you the national numbers. 75, 80, 90, 95. We spoke to a district a couple of weeks ago, and we gave them these numbers about 30% of American teachers are engaged at work. And we said, okay, your typical American district, what percentage of, of your teachers are engaged at work? Oh, 90%. 90%, absolutely. No, it's more like 30%. So somehow we have to figure out, number one, how to have conversations about engagement at work. Number two, maybe measure engagement at work for faculty and staff. But number three, what I want you to know is the more hopeful people are, the more engaged they are. So of the people that are hopeful, whether it's students, faculty, or staff, 75% of them are engaged. So if you do want an engaged body, then you could go through two ways that we've already talked about. Get people to do more of what they do best, strengths, or make people more hopeful. Those two things lead to engagement. Those two things lead to engagement. So if you want to become the first school in the country to do engagement work, um, talk to Brandon Busteed, who's presented here in the past, and I'm sure he'll make it happen. Hopeful students are happy students, so if you care about your students' well-being, um, you'll make them more hopeful because they will be more happy. Um, and this is, this happiness thing, let me ask you this, do you, there's happiness in life and then success in life. Do you think the causal arrow goes from success in life to happiness in life or from happiness in life to success in life? Which way do you think it goes? Happiness to success, that's right. For a long time, for a long time in psychology and business and in education, folks said, the more successful you are, the happier you will be. So that was the goal, that was the, what everybody was chasing. So the golden ticket was, was success. That will lead to happiness. But now we've discovered through um, lots of research that the happier you are, the more successful you'll be. So the same thing with health. So the happier you are, the healthier you'll be. So it's not, oh, I'm ha healthy, therefore I'm going to be happy. It's really, I'm happy, therefore I'm going to be healthy. So hope leads to happiness. Happiness leads to success and health. And hopeful students are resilient students. Um, I'm not going to say too much more about that. So investing in the future pays off today. Any questions or comments to this point? Yes. Wow. So focusing on one domain of life, which is the kind of the financial house, getting that financial house in order for these mothers um, is kind of a key to kicking off hope throughout their lives, would you say? Yes. Okay. I, that's wonderful. The name of uh, her group is the Financial Hope Collaborative. Financial Hope Collaborative. Very nice. Very nice. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. How many mothers do you work with a year? Um. Wow. 
Fantastic, fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. Other thoughts or questions you'd like to share? Okay. Um, thinking about your outcomes here at work, hope makes a big difference at work as well. We did another, about four dozen studies, about 50 studies looking at hope and um, workplace outcomes. We looked at this in fast food restaurants. We looked at it in factories. We looked at it in academia. And what we found is that hope accounts for about 14% of the variance in work outcomes. So hope makes a difference. Um, if you want to think about working a seven-day work week, which some of you do, um, hope accounts for uh, a whole day's worth of productivity out of a seven-day work week. So it's really meaningful, um, and it's something that, that you ought to spread to your students, excuse me, to your staff members. Um, let's talk about followers needing hope, but before I do that, we're going to do one more table assignment. Um, and these are two questions I want you to tackle at the table individually and then share out the results, okay? So the first question is, who is the most influential leader in your life? Who is the most influential leader in your life? And then the second question is, what three things does that person give you to make your life better? So the first question is, who is the most influential leader in your life? And the second question is, what three things does that person give you to make your life better? So you write those things down on your own, and then do as quick a share out as we can. Um, and we'll just do about five minutes worth of that. <laughs> now we asked, we asked 10,001 people these exact questions. We asked them, who's the most influential leader? Who is the most influential leader in your life? And then we asked them, um, name three things that that person uh, gave to you to make your life better. All right? One of those things was hope. So lots of folks named lots of different leaders. Um, we did the study twice because the first time we did it, we didn't say living, uh, living leader. Um, and the second time we did, uh, the results were exactly the same. So it doesn't matter if the leader is still living, um, as a spiritual leader, is not a spiritual leader, the results are exactly the same. What are the four followers' needs? What are people looking toward you as a leader uh, to, to meet in their life, to give them in their life? Here are the four things. Hope, stability, stability, trust, and compassion. Hope, stability, trust, and compassion. There are lots of leadership studies. There are not a lot of followership studies. So this was a study of followership in a sense. So what do people need from their leaders? Hope, stability, trust, and compassion. Now one simple exercise for you to do as a leader is to think about how your communication every day communicates, lines up with those four followers' needs. To what extent are you encouraging hope in other people through your emails, your phone calls, your daily interactions? Yep. Yeah. Con consistency. You are, you're, you're not Janice, the two-faced. Um, so you're consistent, you're stable. From time one to time two, from person A to person B, you're giving the same uh, reactions, the same responses. You're consistent and stable across time. Trust is kind of the emotional um, version of that, that you can be trusted um, and, and you build trust across communications uh, and then compassion is, is kind of that platonic love that we feel for one another. Um, those are kind of the shorthand definitions of those. Is that okay? Yeah, okay, very good, very good. All right, so to what extent are you sending out emails that communicate those kinds of things, hope, stability, trust, and compassion? To what extent are you standing up and delivering an address, a speech, um, teaching a class, leading a family, 
Um, to what extent are you meeting those needs for hope, stability, trust, and compassion? It makes a really big difference, obviously, but what I want you to know is that um, the spread of emotional uh, emotions, um, it's a contagion. It's a contagion. So I have these four penguins up there for a reason. Well, two reasons. One, because they're so cute. Um, two, because they signify how emotions spread from one person to another to another to another. So Nicholas Christakis um, did some work on the emotional and social contagions that happen in our daily lives. And emotions go from that first penguin to the second penguin, from the second penguin to the third penguin, and the third penguin to the fourth penguin. And that fourth penguin probably doesn't know the first penguin. So in other words, how you spread those emotions every day, how you meet the needs for hope, stability, trust, and compassion can affect not only your workers' lives, but their families' lives. Not only your students' lives, but their families' lives. So that emotional contagion is something that I want you to be very sensitive to um, because it certainly does make a difference in, in our lives. So if you're teaching a class of 250 people, they're going out and they're infecting another group of people. And that group of people is infecting another group of people. So we really have to be mindful of how these emotional and social contagions work. Now here's something back to engagement. Follower engagement soars when leaders make them enthusiastic about the future. So here's one extra tip for today. Well, and, and we noticed it during the financial crisis. We, we had a lot of uh, um, consulting opportunities during the uh, 2008 financial crisis. And um, folks were saying, I can't be enthusiastic about the future during these down times. And then we would say, well, then you can't be a leader during these down times. Um, because that's what a leader does. A leader is enthusiastic about the future. To what extent? Are you enthusiastic about the future? That's kind of part of your hope makeup and the extent to which you're pursuing your own hopes and dreams. But what we found is that when followers said, my leader makes me enthusiastic about the future, 69% of them are engaged at work. 69%. When followers said, my leader does not make me enthusiastic about the future, 1% of followers are engaged at work. So keep in mind, 30% of people are engaged at work. You can get to 69% if you have a leader who makes them enthusiastic about the future. So that's a really big difference. Um, let's talk a little bit about change strategies, and then we have some, some questions um, for you to answer at your tables about Creighton's hopes. Um, well, I'll give you some, some more ideas, but how do you spread hope in your community? How do you spread hope at Creighton? What are some ways that you do it? So think about that, and I'll, I'll call on you randomly and put you on the spot. Um, but I want to tell you a story about Bev Tatum. Have you heard of Bev Tatum? She's president at Spelman University. Um, it just the mentioned in financial crisis made me think of Bev's work. Um, she started something called the Starfish Initiative, the Starfish Initiative. So she realized during the financial crisis that there were going to be women at her university who were going to be short on cash to finish their degrees. So she started a special initiative where she went out and she raised money for individual students. So in other words, she would say, I've got a, a woman pursuing a teacher ed certificate, and a teacher ed degree, and she's one semester away from finishing school. She needs $10,000 would you sponsor this student? So she created a whole program and raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. And there's this great story I tell in the book. It's great because I say it's great, I guess. Um, I think it's a great story. It's about this one woman. She woke up one morning and she, she decided, OK, I've got to either pay my tuition or go home. I've got to figure out exactly how much money I owe. I need to call my parents. I need to figure out if there's any way I can pay my tuition. She wakes up in the morning. She knows she's got a, you know, a five-digit uh, check that she needs to cut and somehow make, make the tuition for the, the last term. And she gets online, and she calls up her account, 
and she owes zero dollars. Zero dollars. Because the Starfish Initiative had paid for her last semester of education. So what hopeful people do, what hopeful leaders do, is they knock down obstacles. They knock down obstacles. Um, they also don't, don't put obstacles up. So policies can often put a lot of obstacles up. So we encourage higher ed groups to go through policies and do a policy audit to make sure that they're, they're not instituting policies that make, make being a student more difficult. So one thing I always ask groups like this is, when's the last time that you, you try to enroll and pay for tuition as if you were a student at Creighton? So raise your hand if you did that in the last two years. So you did like a mock enrollment. We don't do it. We don't, we don't do mock enrollments. We don't walk through a student's life. Um, but we know when we ask them, what are the hard things about enrolling, we get a whole lot of responses. When we ask them, what are the hard things about paying tuition, we get a whole lot of responses. So we need to figure out what are some ways that we can knock down obstacles for students. Um, at this point, what I want to do, there's some buzz questions that, that and I want to say Katie um, has just been so helpful, and, and Katie has been a delight. So there's Katie in the background there, Katie Bacon. Um, Katie, thank you so much for inviting me to be here, and Jeff and other folks, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, but Katie came up with these questions, and I think they're good ones, and what I want you to do is talk, talk about them at your tables. What is Creighton's greatest hope opportunity? That's question number one, so you might want to write these down. So what is Creighton's greatest hope? What is Creighton's greatest hope? And number two, what diminishes hope, and I'm going to add at Creighton, what diminishes hope at Creighton, and what are the solutions? What diminishes hope at Creighton, and what are the solutions? So what is Creighton's greatest hope? And number two, what diminishes hope at Creighton, and what are the solutions? Let's take about five minutes, and, and then we'll wrap up. So five minutes to talk about those two questions. So I'll start with this table, because it seems like you're already on a roll. What's Creighton's greatest hope? Our students. Our I think students. if you work with any of our student bodies, you, you'll be just energized by their energies, their hopes, their for the future. And so I think, I mean, I don't even have to tell you stories about those. And they, in turn, you know, motivate us to be even better uh, faculty and staff and, and, and everything. And so we were kind of talking about the strategic plan and um, how maybe the story is lost a little bit about our hope, which is our students. And um, in order to get there, that maybe that is really the focus that we need to say, this is who we are and why we're here. And yes, we need financial stability, but if you're an idealist, I think it's going to be hard to find it in the strategic plan the way it is right now. Not to say it's bad. I mean, we're just talking about maybe putting the hopeful piece of Creighton in the middle of it mm -hmm. would, would maybe change a little bit of the internal issues that we're facing. So, I mean, you, you live and work in a hope factory. Yes. I mean, th that's what a, a, a place of learning is. Um, so the, the students are those purveyors of hope. Okay. Exactly. Other, other, what it, what is, other comments about your greatest hope? And we have a microphone back here. So what about this table here? Just throw the microphone in the middle of the table. OK, OK, OK. Um, we talked a little bit about, um, we agree with the students, but what you're trying to do is quantify hope, and it's a hard thing to get your hands around. And uh, we sort of agreed that Creighton's on the edge of really something great. Mm -hmm. But you have to have a lot of hope, and you have to have a few prayers. And it's hard, I think, for some people. They feel powerless. The change is um, scary. Mm -hmm. And so you have those other influences that are, um, when you talk about what diminishes that hope and the solutions, Sometimes it's just fear. And so Creighton, I think, is on the edge of something great. I think um, if we can, you, know, you can stay the path and, and, and embrace our students and uh, interact with them and not see them as something that's burdensome, 
but something that is really a, a, a resource and a treasure and take strength from that, then I think you, you are looking at what Creighton's greatest hope is. Mm -hmm. So I, I do like to quantify hope. Um, so we measured hope as part of the, the Gallup college student survey that we, we did on, on your students. And 48% of your students are hopeful, 48%. Now, the, the next question, which I got at the ta front table here, is what's the, what's the benchmark? Remember I told you you, get, you guys are the first to do the college student survey? We don't have a benchmark. I can tell you um, American students grades 5 through 12, um, about 54% of American students grades 5 through 12 are hopeful. About 48% of your students are hopeful, and about half of Americans at large are hopeful. So I would say it's right in the ballpark, you know, using the benchmarks that we do have, but we don't have a nationally representative college student sample to benchmark it against. But I would say you're right, your, your students are the greatest hope, and you're saying fear might be the greatest hindrance. Is that right? Um, there's, over here, you guys had a comment about the, the greatest hindrance or, or the greatest uh, um, obstacle to, yeah. Mouthful, sorry. We were just talking about we think one of the greatest hindrances is, is really the lack of trust, and th mm -hmm. that can really tear down the overall hope and kind of our vision and goals. Yeah, yeah. That's where meeting the four followers' needs is so important. So just think about that in your strategic plan. Think about that in the messages that, that you want to get from, from your, your president. Think about that in the messages that you want to share with other people. Um, you don't get to pick and choose which followers' needs you meet. So it's not like, oh, Tuesday's Hope Day. Tomorrow I'll be compassionate. Friday I'll be stable. And someday next week I'll be trustworthy. All right? Every day people are looking for hope, stability, trust, and compassion from you. Every day. So it needs to be clear, as I mentioned, from our email communication all the way through to our strategic plan. Okay? We're running out of time, so I want to leave you with this quote. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Um, that's from Robert F. Kennedy. Um, hope is hard to come by sometimes, but it's not at your institution. It's not at your institution. Half of your students are hopeful. Hopefully at least half of you are hopeful. Um, and that's a really good starting point. Uh, and then spreading hope can be done through a contagion. So sharing hope with the next person, that's all you have to do. And they'll share it with the next person. And then they'll share it with the next person, OK? So start working on those hopeful contagions. Uh, think about engagement as a byproduct of hope. And then going all the way back to the beginning, um, what are your top five strengths in order of intensity? and tell one loved one a, a meaningful story about you at your best. You do those things today, and I think you become a little bit better leader who can meet those demands of hope, stability, trust, and compassion. Thank you so much.